All right, so I'm going to spend in the time between now and our next break and a building on the information that that uh, Carrie and Valencia provided in how do we take care of the vaccine? How do we, we make sure that our approaches are safe? And now we're at the point of what do we need to do to administer? What needs to be in place both for safety of the um, healthcare worker, safety of the patient, and then make sure that our administration approaches are, are such that the patient will receive the vaccine correctly and in a way that, uh, uh, as Valencia mentioned, will make them want to come back. We'll also talk, uh, and I'll intersperse some patient education and safety information with the different vaccines. So Carrie had mentioned earlier the importance of using the information that we have uh, on the CDC website, as well as the Immunization Action Coalition or immunize.org now. And I think a great place to start and something that everybody should have, and anybody that is involved in immunization should have read this guideline and be familiar because this provides a lot of the basics for how you uh, develop and implement vaccination programs. You know, when, when people are asking, well, you know, what do I do if I if I um, am late with a dose, or what do I do if, uh, if I don't have documentation and a patient is providing me with, with information? These types of, of guiding uh, principles are included in this ACIP guideline. This is very general information. It's not sp um, focused on any one specific vaccine, but it's really focused on every vaccines and what uh, should be involved in our approach. So I wholeheartedly suggest that everyone uh, make sure you've got a, a hard copy. Also then, I uh, wanna again, reinforce what Valencia talked about in preparing vaccine, that the, these are fragile and expensive assets that need to be managed in a way so that every step in the administration process is done uh, with the, the patient at the center. So that means we do not need to have mistakes. Uh, we need to evaluate the process and then uh, approach the uh, administration, the, the handling and the preparation with a sense of uh, error prevention. So make sure that the environment is clean, uh, all the services are disinfected, that it's free from distra distraction. Some places even will employ very, very drastic methods, such as anybody that is that is preparing vaccine puts on a colored vest, and so nobody talks to them. Nobody goes near them during that preparation because it's so easy to make mistakes. Remember, safe injection practices start at the time you touch that first vial or that first needle or syringe all the way through to injection of that vaccine or administration to the patient. So everything needs to be handled uh, correctly. The supplies that we are going to use need to be readily available so you can pick the right supplies. So, for example, if you have a pick the right supplies that are needed for that individual patient and you don't need to have have uh, anybody developing vaccine uh, programs hunting for those things. If you're going to be administering vaccines, all the items you need should be readily available. Making sure then that available for you to use immediately uh, after you are finished with any needle. And then make sure that you're, you are preparing vaccine in close proximity is being stored. You don't wanna carry it around easy again to become distracted or set something down that perhaps you shouldn't have. Uh, so keep everything and then make sure, of course, that you have a place to, uh, to clean your hands. Valencia mentioned safe injection practice. This is part of standard precautions. And so standard precautions are, are aptly named. This should be the standard approach we use for every patient, every time, and every circumstance. Doesn't matter what health setting you are, you are in a standard precautions should always be included. And that is, separation of clean from dirty, making sure that you've got what you need close at hand and that your focus is on uh, preventing error. And then again, healthcare should not be, be performed in any way that is providing opportunity for bloodborne pathogens. And this is not only to the patients, but the healthcare workers. So remember, not only does CDC have a role in safe injection practice, but OSHA has a role in protecting the healthcare workers. So we need to make sure things such as 
uh, uh, needle safety devices are readily available and the expectation is that they are used because that protects the healthcare worker. Our safe injection practice, again, aseptic technique, don't reuse anything. Um, a single dose vial is a single dose vial, so you never pool that. Don't save that little bit that's left over and think you can, you can stretch that into another dose. Uh, don't ever enter any vial with anything that is used. And then remember, those single dose vials have no preservative. So if you contaminate that vial, that means that whatever you use to contaminate, that will be present in the vaccine that you are injecting into that patient. So you use the utmost uh, care. Right patient, right vaccine, right dose, right time, right route. Those are everything that anyone that administers medication, this has been taught to us over and over and over again. It is appropriate for vaccines as with any other medication. All right, so when you are ready to give a vaccine, make sure that you're looking at what you are, are about to administer. Make sure that it's in its proper environment. If it's a refrigerated vaccine, it should be in the refrigerator. Uh, if it's a frozen vaccine, it should be maintained in the freezer and you take it out immediately before you use it. After you're done, if it's a multi-dose vial, you immediately put that vial back into its proper environment, that you don't leave anything out for the day, that the longer any type of vaccine is out of its appropriate environment, that is cumulative. So that vial does not heal itself. All of that time continues to add up and then that's a reduction in the, the potency of that, that vaccine. So that means we're always evaluating vaccine for proper care in that cold chain process. Carrie mentioned that you know, the cold chain starts at the time the vaccine is manufactured and it ends at the time the vaccine is actually administered. So our responsibility when we get vaccine is to make sure immediately it goes in the right temperature, it stays there all the time, it is out of the refrigerator or frozen environment for very brief periods of time before it is administered to the patient. And then check not only expiration date, but Carrie mentioned the beyond use date. So if you, if you have a, a vial of vaccine that is uh, appropriate for multi-dose use, it may not be good, quote, good until its expiration date. It may have a much more limited period of time where it can be used. That's called the beyond use date. So make sure that that is properly documented. And uh, the standard for documenting that is you put the date that the vaccine will no longer be good. So if I administer it on the first of the month and it is uh, going to be beyond its use in 28 days, then I write the date that would be the 28th day on that, that vaccine vial. And it needs to be clear. So it's, um, you know, it's written in in something that is gonna be legible. It doesn't cover up the label and so forth. So there's a distinct process for that type of documentation. And then look at your, at your um, medication, look at your vaccine. Some vaccines have to be shaken. We've got a very few number of these, but they need to be shaken and, that, and then get back into a suspension. This is why some vaccines will actually have as part of their they're uh, prescribing information, the package insert that will tell you how to put the, the box in the refrigerator. Sometimes the vials or the, the syringes are supposed to be standing up. Sometimes they're supposed to be lying down. So you need to follow those directions. Those, vac those vaccines that need to be shaken and back up in, into suspension. Think about it the last time you had a, if you made a glass of chocolate milk, and all the chocolate is on the bottom, uh, it settles to the bottom of the glass. If the glass is standing straight up, then you've got a very thick layer of chocolate as opposed to the, the if you turn your glass sideways, then it'll have a very thin layer. So you can see if you think of your syringe instead of that glass of milk, it's gonna be a lot easier to resuspend uh, everything into solution if that it is stored flat, stored horizontally rather than, than vertically. So know your, know your vaccine. And then make sure that if you have to reconstitute that, uh, you give that immediately. 30 minutes really should be the outside time. You should prepare that immediately for, uh, for administration and not leave it uh, out. If you reconstitute a vial of vaccine and your patient changes their mind, and that's something that has happened, or perhaps you find information that you did not 
did not already have, and, and maybe that vaccine is not necessary, uh, then you may have to dispose of, of that dose of vaccine. I think Carrie had mentioned whenever you have those types of situations, it's good to have somebody that you can call just to verify because again, vaccines are expensive. You don't want to throw it away. And so find out if you have any alternative, then double check that before uh, you discard that vaccine. Again, when you fill the syringe, I use sterile technique to avoid contamination of sterile items. Remember, your needle is sterile, your syringe is sterile, the vaccine is sterile. So all of those things need to be handled very deliberately. And then make sure as you, if you have a, a vial that has that plastic cap on the top, that plastic cap on the top of the vial does not ensure sterility of that rubber diaphragm. All it does is keep it from being punctured. So you need to disinfect the top of that vial every time you enter it and make sure that you are using a sterile alcohol swab. We had an outbreak in the US some um, uh, several years ago when someone thought, wow, sterile alcohol swabs are a lot more expensive than unsterile alcohol swabs. And so they began to use unsterile alcohol swabs and then very quickly had some negative outcomes identified in, uh, in patients. So that should be your standard sterile alcohol swabs. Please avoid doing some of the makeshift um, alcohol uh, cotton balls that you see, um, that we've seen a lot, unfortunately, in some mobile events where somebody will put a, a bunch of cotton balls in a Ziploc baggie and pour some alcohol in. That is not, um, that is not good practice. So I would not recommend that you do that. Also, if you inject air into vaccine vials, and now many of us, you know, when, when I went to you know, to nursing school, I'm one of those like 50 years ago, uh, we learned that you injected whatever volume of, of, of uh, medication you're going to withdraw, first you inject that same amount of air so that you try to make sure that you maintain kind of a normal pressure, not, not positive or negative. But what we find is that when you do that, that when that vial, that diaphragm is pierced multiple times, if you have any positive pressure in that vial, you're gonna have leak. So your vaccine is gonna leak out. And remember anything that leaks out, something can also then be transferred back into that vial. So you do not need to inject air into these multi-dose vials, that there is sufficient uh, pressure uh, difference that you should not need to do that. What withdraw your vaccine volume before you pull the needle out of the vial. We don't do any of that that bride of Frankenstein, you know, laboratory where you're squirting things up in the air. We don't do that. You make sure you've got the right amount of dose in your syringe before you pull the needle out of that vial. And then label the syringe so that you know exactly what is in that syringe. Now, some people have grown up with, uh, you know, before we had really good needle technology, learn that, you know, and are afraid that they're gonna use, if they use a needle to withdraw vaccine and use that same needle for patient administration, they're afraid that needle may not be sharp. Well, the needle technology of today, those needles are gonna be sharp. You will, there really is no need any longer to change needles. If it's something that you just feel like you have to do, it, it, there, there's, no, there's no recommendation against it but there is then a recognition that this is an opportunity for contamination and does represent an infection control risk. So don't do it um, unless you feel that you must. And then don't mix vaccines in the same syringe. And then of course, avoid drawing up vaccines in batches. Don't take a, a 10 dose multi-dose vial and go ahead and draw up all of your vaccine. We know that the material that compose syringes may sometimes cause some some leaching of the uh, of the some of the vaccine components, and uh, so you may impact actually the safety of your vaccine uh, by doing that. So drop one vial, one vaccine at a time, and then that's what you administer. Or if you are going to be administering very quickly, so like in mass vaccination events, you might be drawing up your entire vial just to ensure that you get all of the doses out you should make sure then that uh, those um, syringes are gonna be used very quickly. So you don't uh, keep them hanging around. Right? Again, clean hands always, you know, the rule of thumb is if your hands are visibly dirty, use soap and water. Other times, alcohol hand rubs. There are many different options. Uh, the only thing that we really want is it should be 60% alcohol or greater, but the greater the, uh, the percent of alcohol, the more risk there is of just drying of the skin. And we know that, that is one reason why healthcare workers will push back 
from using alcohol-based hand rubs because they're afraid that it dries uh, the skin of their hands. And it may, if we are not using then um, hand rubs that have the emollients to help protect that. So it's always a good rule of thumb. Whatever products you're gonna have in your clinic, uh, have the people that are doing the work involved in selecting them, you know, selecting those products. So if there is an issue, you'll know it up front, and then the um, and people that are using it have a say-so in what is available. But at the end of the day, you know, clean hands have, have to be non-negotiable. This is a, a picture of what you should have in any patient care area. You have a way to keep your hands clean. So you've got alcohol hand rub, you have a sharps container, and then you have gloves. But please remember, CDC states that glove use is not a requirement. And the reason we wear gloves is outlined in the OSHA Bloodborne Pathogen Standard, and that indicates that you wear personal protective equipment based upon what you can reasonably anticipate. And if you are using appropriate administration technique uh, when you are administering um, medication by injection, that your technique is your control uh, for, for minimizing the, the time that you see or are exposed to blood or body fluids. So focus on doing those things like making sure your patient has a nice relaxed arm, having a gauze readily available and so forth. Uh, but we find that the, the more uh, the individuals that, that use gloves oftentimes will keep hands clean less often and also are more likely in several studies to, um, to have injury themselves. You lose some of that manual dexterity wearing gloves and that you end up either sticking yourself or having difficulty activating safety devices. So um, glove use is not the requirement. And I'd encourage people to, to make sure you're evaluating your technique um, first thing. Again, uh, disinfection of, of your work area. There are a number of different disinfectants. The thing that we're looking at now is make sure that whatever product you're using is on the EPA's list N. That is the, the guiding um, uh, principle for germicides now because it impacts emerging infectious diseases. And certainly we're still thinking about COVID. Quaternary ammoniums are the most common germicides, some hypochl sodium hypochlorite or bleach. Just remember if you've got bleach wipes that if you, you know, hold the wipe against your clothing uh, for any reason, um, you'll, you'll see the, the results as that will impact the, the material, the color of the material. Wipes are great um, to use because it involves everybody and make sure that everybody realizes that keeping your environment clean doesn't just, isn't a, a job that belongs to one person. It's part of what we all do. And then again, alcohol um, prep pads should always be sterile. I put a number of needles and syringes out just to remind you that whatever you're going to be using for administration, make sure you know your equipment. Uh, that not only do you know the, the syringes themselves, but you know if you're drawing up vaccine, uh, what, const what is it that, how do you know when you have 0 0.5 mLs? You know, where on the, where is that marking? Is it the top of the little rubber barrel or the bottom of the rubber barrel? You, you need to verify that everybody knows they're dosing correctly in these, these needles and syringes because we have so many different types. You also need to know the needles that you're using. As we have become accustomed during uh, COVID uh, vaccination, uh, many of us uh, used uh, the retractable needles and you need to prepare your patient for that because if you administer a vaccine and as you uh, push the plunger all the way in, that needle is spring loaded and it will retract into the barrel of the syringe. So after your injection, as you pull the syringe away from the patient's arm and they look down, they're gonna see a syringe with no needle. And they're immediately gonna wonder, where did that needle go? Did you, is it, did you break it off in my arm? And we've had a number of situations where that becomes very concerning for patients and for healthcare workers if they didn't realize that they weren't gonna see that needle any longer. So make sure that you have um, the equipment at, as uh, part of your training as well. I put that, uh, Valencia had mentioned a bit about dead space and the, the, um, the maintenance of blood in syringes. Uh, the, the recognition of the importance of dead space has been, has, has been part of the conversation in needle exchange programs because if uh, people are reusing needles, then they are retaining some of the, the blood 
potentially in the hub of that syringe. So if you look at this picture, the, the picture on the left, everything that is red, that could be retained blood, blood in the, in the needle, then blood down in the hub, all the way to the rubber end of the plunger. In fact, this particular syringe um, has a, about 92 microliters of dead space in that needle and syringe combination. That's almost 0.1 mLs. So you may say, well, that's not very much, but those of us that have worked with the, vac with the COVID-19 vaccines, if you, many of the vials have exactly what you need to get the exact number of doses, you don't have any, any waste. So if you are using uh, syringes with a lot of dead space, you would frequently lose one, one dose of vaccine for every vial you used. So know your equipment so that you're using low dead space uh, needles and syringes. And the dead space again is, this is the, uh, the area of the syringe that retains any type of fluid after injection has already occurred. So the barrel of the, the plunger has been pushed all the way forward as far as it can go. So everything that can be administered has been administered. But look over on the left, once that, that plunger has already gone to the very front of that, that syringe, you still have 0 0.1 that is left in the tip of the syringe and the needle. So we have become very aware of our needle and syringe combinations. And that you see on the, on the right, the type of syringes that we were using, both the insulin and those, those um, retractable needles and syringes had only three microliters of, uh, of uh, dead space. So much more uh, usable for these types of situations where you're trying to make, make sure every dose counts. Valencia also mentioned they, some of the no-touch zones. And again, when you're taking the tip off a pre-filled syringe, the exposed area of that syringe is that no-touch zone. So that means that you have to pull the tip off with your fingertips and make sure that you know your syringe. Some of these pull off, some of the tips have to be twisted off. So you can sit and struggle and struggle with some of these syringes um, if you don't, um, don't remove the tips correctly. So uh, take the time to look at the, the package insert and see what the information tells you about uh, moving forward with that, that vaccine. Then when you apply a needle, keep your fingers away. Uh, that not only keep your fingers away from the end of the needle, keep your fingers away from the end of the syringe so you can very easily uh, twist the needle on so it will stay in place throughout the entire injection process. If you don't secure those correctly, then uh, you uh, either end up injecting uh, the vaccine and it leaks out the side of the needle, or in some cases, the needle and syringe may become completely separated. And that's certainly not something that you want to have happen during vaccine administration. Making sure that you are disinfecting the top of your vials that whole, um, the, the idea of scrub the hub, making sure that you take 15 seconds of, of that mechanical uh, friction to uh, <coughs> cleanse the top of that vial. And then make sure that as you are using these small vials, keep your fingers well away so that you do not touch the area where that needle is entering the vial. You have to hold that so you can clearly see what you're doing and also make sure that you are not touching anything that is part of that no touch zone. And then always make sure that you um, know how to activate your safety device. Keep your finger well away from the end of that needle. You should never be doing anything with the two-handed method um, because uh, something will go wrong more often than not. So keep your fingers well away from uh, the end of that uh, needle. And uh, it's so much easier to give uh, all the personnel a needle and syringe and let them practice activating before you, you start using it. That's gonna be, although it's gonna be waste, it's gonna be money well spent uh, to protect your healthcare workers. All right, once you know how to manage all this, now how do we deal with our patient? Well, we're gonna work with them to develop then a vaccination plan. If they need more than one vaccine, then get their input on how you're gonna approach this. Make sure that we get a reliable vaccination history and some documentation. Please remember your patient will not have good recall. Some may, but most will not. So do not rely on patient recall. Uh, both regarding when they received a vaccine and what vaccine they received. 
uh, always search for, for documentation. Then there are a few rules that you need to remember. If you're administering live vaccines, those attenuated uh, vaccines that we talked about, you either wanna give them on the same day or you need to separate them by 28 to 30 days. And there are some differences. Some of the vaccines will say in their prescribing information, separate by 28 days. Others will say separate by 30 days. So you need to follow whatever is in that, uh, that prescribing information. There isn't any such restriction for inactivated vaccines. You can give an inactivated one day and then give another the next day. The real issue is gonna be having that conversation with the patient and knowing your patient well enough to determine what's gonna be the best approach for them. How much should I wait? How long should I wait? Do I need to give vaccines so, uh, so closely together? If you need to, you can. If you don't need to, then it's, it's great to space. Remember it, you know, the kind of our rule of thumb is it takes about 14 days for you to your patient to receive whatever the fullest benefit of that vaccine is going to be. This is why uh, some vaccines will recommend that, you know, you, for, for example, a uh, yellow fever vaccine, you need to have that a specified amount of time before you enter a risk area. So, uh, and in fact, some of the travel regulations may specify that you have to have this amount of time before you can enter a, a country. So not only know your vaccines, know then the purpose of that administration, vaccine administration, and then how that fits in with developing that timeline. If t TB skin testing is, is being done, uh, then the general CDC guidelines are to either vaccinate and perform TB skin testing on the same day or wait uh, four to six weeks after vaccine administration. And that's only if the skin test is done. If you're doing the, the blood assay like uh, Quantifier on Gold or T-Spot, you can do those um, and you will not see that, that um, uh, injection site uh, reaction interference. And then the rule of thumb is if any vaccine series is started, if you're late, you don't need to restart the series. So um, we, we get those questions quite a bit. If someone was too late with their, their hepatitis B vaccine, uh, do they need to restart? No, they do not. You just pick up uh, where they left off. But again, go back to the prescribing information and uh, do any verification. Once you're ready to go, review that plan again with your patient and then talk with them about allergies and other contraindications to vaccine. Is there a reason why that vaccine may hurt them as opposed to helping them? So keeping track of, of that information in any type of medical record, asking the patient very clearly about um, allergies or prior vaccine experiences, and, uh, and then making sure that you are documenting that. Take time, and I think uh, uh, Kimball Ford talked about this earlier, take time and talk with your patient. They need to know that you're, they are important to you. So put down your pen or turn away from your computer and face-to-face -face have those discussions so you can listen to their questions and then convey information accurately and openly. And it may, may turn out that the patient decides not to be vaccinated. Well, remember that is their decision, but make sure that it's been an informed decision. At the same time, also let them know about what they could expect from a vaccine. If it's going to be more than a sore arm, you know, let them letting them know what they may experience. And then if they have a question, you would rather have them call you than to assume that something went wrong. Provide the vaccine information statements and review that with them. And then again, make sure the environment is optimal for the patient. If you have somebody that tells you, I pass out when I have blood drawn or when I had a vaccine, don't give them their vaccine when they're standing up. Even sometimes don't give it to them when they're sitting down. If you have the ability to let them lie down, then, then do that. You know, Think about what the patient needs. And you will have some people that you can tell when, they, when, you're, you know, when you're getting ready to, to vaccinate them, all of a sudden you know, their sweat pops out or, or now they're, you know, they, they, they are, are pale or shaking or whatever. You know, be attentive to what your patient looks like so you can keep things, bad things from happening. I mentioned the vaccine information statements. Those are written at about a 10th grade reading level. So you, if, it's, if you know your patient and you can let them read the vaccine information statements, many offices will keep laminated copies, maybe color coding them so patients can read them. If you're gonna have multiple vaccines, make sure that they have time to read them and don't rush through that. And then be sure and ask them, 
did you, do you have any questions? Do you, anything that was not clear? And you may even remind them, this is for this vaccine, it is for this purpose, this is gonna be the series, just doing a quick uh, review. But always make sure that you're using the latest vaccine information statement. And remember, that's the law that we need to do this and we need to document that not only the, the individual received that information, but they had access to a copy. They may leave it in your office, that's okay. That's their choice, but make sure that you are providing that to them and that you'll need to document the, the date that is actually on that VIS, on that statement in your medical record. So you're showing the ones that was current. Now people ask all the time, do I have to have a consent before vaccination? CDC specifically states that consents are a barrier, considered to be a barrier to vaccination. However, we know in today's times that your, your health system, your hospital, your long-term care facility may take a different approach and they may want signed consent. You certainly can do that, but it is not a federal requirement um, by any means. And then make sure that if you are requiring consent, make sure that, that your patient understands why that you're not trying to, to get out of responsibility or you're not trying to, you know, to, uh, you know, to minimize them in any way, uh, make sure that they know the purpose of that consent and, uh, and realize it's not a requirement. All right, when you're ready to vaccinate, every patient is screened every time, every patient for every vaccination that is administered or any medication that, it is, pres that is prescribed. And remember, contraindications are reasons for a vaccine not to be administered. Warnings or precautions are things that you want to talk more about and determine if they are a reason to either defer, delay, or not administer. But a contraindication should be you don't give it, okay? So as severe allergic reactions, anaphylaxis to a prior dose, those should all be considered to be contraindications. Now, your patient needs to know, what do you mean by a severe allergic reaction? So anybody who has ever administered a tetanus vaccine, you know that you can, your patient can develop arthritis. That is a, a, a huge red arm from shoulder to fingertips. That is not a, an anaphylactic reaction. That certainly was a very pronounced reaction to that vaccine, but we have no evidence that a future dose of tetanus vaccine would produce the same results. But your patient needs to know that. Can you imagine, will your patient want another tetanus vaccine, if that happened, no, certainly not without some type of education. So make sure that you are well-versed and you know how to have these discussions, all right? Make sure that um, you do this with every uh, vaccine and you are discussing these warnings and precautions every time. And then remember, screening is important because it helps prevent a serious reaction. All right, at the time of administration, you wanna know their current health status. Are they immunocompromised? Are they pregnant? Do they have any, you know, are there those warnings, precautions, contraindications? Uh, what was their previous vaccination experience? Anything that you need to discuss with them about risk and benefit. And then um, recent receipt of blood products is an important one that, that you may need to defer vaccines. If the individual has received blood or a bl blood product within the prior uh, 90 days, then that is a discussion. And again, a refer back to the, the CDC guidance. This is a, an example of uh, immunize.org has the screening checklist. If, uh, if people need that, it's a reminder that you can give vaccines to patients who are sick. Uh, it's, it's a matter of degree and necessity of the vaccine. But some patients will say, I can't have a vaccine because I don't feel well. That may not be the case. And remember, if this may be the only time you see that patient and with withholding a vaccine, even if that person cannot receive full benefit, withholding the vaccine gives them no protection. Administering a vaccine with a diminished response may be the ideal for that patient under those circumstances. So think about you know, what, what is right for that patient at that time. I, I put this uh, on the slide because this is a nice summary that is in the CDC's pink book. The, the, the uh, book that again, should be something in every vaccinating office's uh, hands. This has a lot of the ingredients that are in vaccines that are uh, particular, um, can be problematic, allergens and other problems for some patients. So if somebody says, yes, I'm allergic to neomycin, 
which uh, vaccines uh, are, are they, um, uh, is neomycin in? It gives information about, we've talked a lot about adjuvants. What is an adjuvant? And uh, uh, you, you may have uh, individuals who say, yeah, I've, I've got a problem every time I take an antacid, uh, this is a, a problem that I've had. There may be then some, you know, it may be an aluminum adjuvant, for example, and that may be in the, uh, in the antacid. So again, not only medication, uh, allergies or intolerances, it's important uh, to know about foods with your patients as well. There was mention earlier about latex allergies. Uh, we've got statements from the ACIP that if a patient has an anaphylactic reaction to latex or uh, in response to latex uh, contact, then you need to, to give serious consideration in vaccinating if they have other type of allergic responses or reactions to latex, such as you know, uh, uh, they break out in a rash or, you know, they have red areas where a Band-Aid has been stuck. That uh, is not necessarily a contraindication for vaccine administration. If you have individuals that have bleeding disorders, now everybody's, you know, given somebody a vaccine that is on aspirin therapy or, or taking anticoagulants and you just know you, you're gonna have to apply pressure a little longer. If you have um, uh, people in your practice setting, you might have, have assigned vaccine administration to some of your medical assistants. You might want them to double check with a provider before administering a vaccine. Uh, so you, you've got to know not only your personnel, their capabilities for assessment and response, but know that just because somebody is on aspirin therapy doesn't mean they can't have a vaccine. You just may think about, should I use a smaller needle? But just remember, you know, the, the reason we all took some type of physics in school is that you remember the smaller the diameter, the greater the force. So when you have a very small needle and you are injecting, uh, from uh, a larger ba syringe barrel through a very small needle, the force that you are exerting coming out of that, the end of that needle is gonna be greater than if you used a larger needle. Very similar to in the shower, you turn the, the shower nozzle. If the holes are really small, you know, you feel those little needles of water. You turn it so the holes are bigger, it's not quite as, as painful in the shower. So we, we, we know that in the practical sense, in the injection sense, it becomes important in thinking about uh, your needle size as well. I mentioned this morning, co-administration of vaccines that uh, there is a big push now from CDC to make sure that people are comfortable administering multiple vaccines at the same time. That, and that's a double-edged sword. You know, you wanna make sure that your patient has access to the vaccines, but at the same time, there may be times when you're not comfortable administering more than one vaccine at a given time. And that it's okay to do that. Just think, is this the only opportunity that I'm gonna have to vaccinate this person? Do I need to give flu and pneumococcal and COVID all at the same time because I'm not gonna get them back or the community is right in the midst of, of this triple outbreak situation? I don't want them to get away without vaccinating. Okay, so the, the benefit then may outweigh the risk of potential uh, reduced uh, response to those vaccines. So. Uh, keep that in mind again, uh, and we, you will read a lot on package inserts that, you know, that uh, studies have not been done looking at co-administration of vaccines. That doesn't mean it's unsafe. It just means the studies haven't been done. Uh, so we, you know, we have to use that again as part of our decision-making process. All right, for those needle phobic patients, again, be aware, those are the patients that can take you by surprise very quickly. Uh, they can drop like a rock and uh, you do not want that to happen. So make sure that your office environment is one that allows people to not feel well or to feel fainty and that you can manage that appropriately. And listen, don't make somebody feel bad. You know, I've had, you know, big tall guys that I, that I think, you know, or they're not gonna be afraid of anything, but they, they tell me I'm scared to death of this. Okay, well, you know, let them, let them talk about it. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna make fun of anybody for how they feel about a vaccination. We're really happy for them to be there. Also, um, I have my patients talk to me while I'm uh, vaccinating because if you talk, you can't hold your breath and bear down. And you know, holding breath and bear down oftentimes leads to, to syncope. So uh, have them talk, they can't do that. So I always purposefully ask them a question that they have to tell me something uh, while I actually administer that vaccine. And most of the time they'll say, are you done? 
because you know they haven't had that time to, to focus on it, right? For people who fear fainting, again, let them lie down. And then after um, vaccination, have them get up slowly. Let them lie down however long they need and then begin to, uh, to get up at their own pace. Again, think about how we are administering so we don't do any mix-ups. If I have multiple vaccines I'm administering, I've got to document which vaccine I gave where. That becomes important in case I have to look at patient response. So if I've got two vaccines, I want to label them. That's flu, it's going to go on the right arm. This is pneumococcal, it's going to go on the left arm or whichever vaccine. So make sure that you are clearly documenting those on labels so you can keep track and not get, uh, not get confused and, uh, and not uh, be able to uh, document appropriately. And then I always think about what am I gonna be administering? And if I've got two vaccines that I know are gonna hurt, then I try not to put them in the same arm. So I'll, I'll try to separate those. Again, thinking about uh, patient, uh, patient comfort. All right, once I'm ready to do it, then I've got to think about what's my anatomy, know my anatomic sites, be familiar with the steps involved in administration, be familiar with the equipment, pay attention, and be aware of what are those points along the process where I'm most likely uh, to make an error. And then be open to critique and evaluation. None of us are perfect. And if someone sees something that either can cause patient harm or has the ability to improve, then all of us need to be open to critique and then watch our patients. So if I'm administering a vaccine, I always keep my hand on the patient. So there's always like some sort of connection. For intramuscular injection, there are very specific sites and I included children on this just because children also includes the 18 year old, which is really buttoned right up against the adult, uh, the adult for immunization. So I always put my finger on the process, right? Right at the very top of the shoulder. And then no, I wanna stay away from the shoulder joint. I do not wanna inject anything there. And then I'll drop my thumb down so that my thumb is well below the, the axillary fold. That's kind of the lower aspect of that, that deltoid muscle. And then my injection, my target is right in between those two points. So if I keep my hand there all the time, I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna misplace my, my, my target zone. And I'm also not gonna be inclined to stick myself. So I'm gonna make sure then that, that I have uh, a very clear sight. Um, different size needles are used for children, uh, both shorter uh, as well as a smaller gauge. And then the larger the patient, the more real estate you've got between the outside of their arm and the, the actual muscle. So you're gonna make sure that you're gonna use a needle that's long enough to actually get to the muscle. So that means technique is important. So many people have kind of learned that I grab you know, part of the arm and I, I pull up a hunk. Well, think about that. You've, now you've got a lot of real estate between the outside and that muscle versus that kind of press and spread approach that may push some of that tissue out of the way you need to be, you then may be able to use a little bit shorter needle. You can also, in both adults and children, I use the thigh, but the ideal is, uh, is gonna be the deltoid. If for some reason you cannot, uh, then, and that should be a, an exceptionally rare situation, uh, you certainly can use the thigh. This is a nice graphic that just shows uh, why we use different angles a 90 degree angle for intramuscular because you've got to make it through not only your, your layers of skin, but you want to be well past the subcutaneous area and actually into the muscle. For subcutaneous administration, you use a 45 degree angle that will then keep that needle from going uh, in as deeply. And then for intradermal vaccine, and that's kind of come back in with, with our, our MPOX, uh, our monkeypox vaccine, uh, that now we need to be able to administer the vaccine right under uh, the outer layer of skin into the epidermal area. And so you need to have a much flatter plane uh, for that needle. Also be attentive for intradermal vaccines, you want bevel up. So the, va the vaccine is gonna be, is gonna come out of the syringe and, and the needle and, and move upward uh, instead of down into deeper areas of the, of the uh, arm. Again, if somebody, if your patient is wearing a shirt, you wanna make sure that that shirt is not so tight and makes a tourniquet because it will not only hurt them, it'll bleed. So if they need to get their arm out of the shirt, uh, do so. Have your landmarks so you, um, your area is clearly visible. And then if you are maintaining one hand, 
with your landmarks, you can disinfect then with the other hand uh, and then uh, put your alcohol swab down, get your uh, needle and syringe, and then you'll be able to inject. Again, stay away from the shoulder. Uh, unfortunately, we've had a lot of increases in shoulder injury uh, directly related to injections because uh, there has not been appropriate attention paid to where that um, vaccine is actually being injected. So technique is critical. Get the right size needle, make sure that it's long enough, make sure that the vaccinator knows the anatomy of the area, and then intramuscular uh, should be at a 90 degree angle for injection. Subcutaneous is uh, getting the, the, the uh, vaccine in the tissue beneath the skin, but above the muscle. Uh, generally, the standard is using a five-eighths of an inch needle. Most of those are 23-ish are gauge in size. Uh, the area of vaccine administration usually is the middle third of the upper arm away from larger muscles. So you're the middle third. So think of the arm from shoulder to elbow, divide that into threes, and your target is that middle third. Angles inserted 95, uh, uh, 45 degree angles. And then the kind of the, the technique here is to, to pinch the area of sub Q administration, uh, in, insert the needle, inject the vaccine, and then before you pull the syringe out, release the tissue. That almost does kind of that modified Z track approach, and it changes the, the uh, exit of the needle, will be kind of a different. Uh, a different pathway as the insertion of the needle. So then you don't have leaking and uh, very rarely see, see bleeding uh, with those sub-Q uh, injections. Again, showing the difference, the difference in angles and why you wanna have that 45 degree angle for subcutaneous vaccine administration. Again, holding the arm, keeping that needle flat. It's, very, it's oftentimes very easy to kind of rest the, the syringe on your, the, the, your thumb area that will help you uh, keep that, that angle and then helps you keep your fingers well away uh, from that needle. So if your patient moves, then you don't get stuck. These are the types of vaccines uh, and administrations when you use a diluent. Those uh, diluent vaccines are typically your subcutaneous. If you are reconstituting any type of vaccine, make sure you've got the right diluent. They're not all the same. As you'll see, ones on the left that, that in this case are used for MMR and varicella are sterile water. On the right that are used for vaccines such as yellow fever, they're sodium chloride. Neither one uh, contain a preservative. Uh, so you have to make sure that you have the right um, a diluent and the right uh, components in that diluent. So you don't kill the vaccine. Again, disinfecting the top before you use it. All right, intradermal is a smaller needle length and smaller needle size. It's very uh, similar uh, in when you're injecting intradermal vaccine. Uh, it's the same technique uh, that you used uh, in the old days. If you still do TB skin testing, uh, this would be the same technique. Again, make sure that you verify age requirements and contraindications, and then let somebody know what to expect following intradermal immunization. Oftentimes that you'll see a lot of reaction uh, with intradermal vaccine. So a lot more redness at that area uh, than you would see if the vaccine had been administered either subcutaneously or intramuscularly. So let your patient know that. Again, see the, the flatness of that angle um, when you are doing intradermal uh, injection. Um, some people use a magnifying glass so they can see. I think that's a direct product of the aging of the nursing workforce, but whatever you need, because you need to see the bevel to make sure that it's up and you need to make sure that your tip of that, that needle is uh, right under the skin and not too deep into the, the sub-Q area. And you should see that wheel or that bleb. If you don't, You've got to follow the guidelines for that vaccine administration, and that will tell you you may have to readminister uh, that dose of vaccine. Um, if it leaks out the out of the injection site, you have to estimate how much vaccine you you may have lost. If you lost half or more, that is again the standard. Then you would reinject. So it's easy to make sure that take your time with this technique, don't, there's no need to be in a hurry uh, so that you don't um, uh, lose some, any of that vaccine. Okay, I wanted to mention intranasal. I think Dr. Maris, you talked about the intranasal vaccine this morning. Um, and and uh, even though uh, 
it's good for the very small children, I think down to age two. Um, we still have some adults that want the intranasal vaccine. They just don't like the injectable. And, and that's great. Again, know your equipment, um, make sure your patient's sitting up. I always give them a Kleenex. They don't have to blow their nose, but people feel compelled. I blow my nose before you, you squirt something in it. I make sure that they're ready for administration because I'm gonna put the tip right inside their, their nose and I'm gonna quickly push the plunger to have the spray uh, then uh, go up one nostril. So you remove the, the end of the, the tip cover of the syringe, you, in, you instill, um, administer half of that dose of vaccine, the syringe that we currently use for intranasal uh, vaccination, we just have one that's a flu a vaccine and there's a little clip on the, the plunger so that you can only give half the dose at a time. You administer half, you remove the clip, then you administer the other half in the other nostril. Tell the person to breathe normally. They don't have to sniff or do anything differently. I tell them to keep that Kleenex in case they feel a little bit that, that runs out their nose, that's okay. It's already hit the mucosa, so the magic's already started once I've, I've administered that. Let them know about what they may experience. For example, if they, uh, people uh, will, will sometimes complain of headache after intranasal in influenza admin vaccine administration. Let them know that that's something that may occur. They're probably going to get a stuffy nose because again, everything's happening in the in the nose uh, at, at that uh, at that point and not systemically. So they may uh, feel that they have a stuffy nose or a headache, and that's uh, something that we can expect and uh, and should prepare them for. And then let them know. Uh, about this and then dispose of our supplies appropriately. It's a nice picture that you can see. That little boy looks so happy. Most of the, the people that I see getting that are not quite that thrilled uh, about the, the vaccine, um, but he's uh, taking it like a champ. On the left, you can see how the mist should appear, that it should not be a, a slow uh, pushing of that plunger. You wanna really push the plunger so that that mist is what actually sprays up the nose. All right, after you administer vaccine, watch the patient. The standard again is 15 minutes. If they have any type of, uh, of concern, for example, if you are administering an egg-based vaccine to someone that says, I, I just have an egg intolerance or I'm afraid about egg allergy, well, that'd be somebody that you would uh, want to keep for a little longer. So don't worry about keeping somebody for 30 minutes, but we want to keep people around for some period of time just to make sure uh, that, that they um, uh, do not experience primarily that sinkable episode, that that may not happen immediately. Um, uh, it may be something that has a, a little bit of a delay. So use this time to document, talk with your patient, answer questions, but always be ready just in case. And I think Melissa will talk with us in a bit about what is involved in emergency response. You need to be ready um, as well as be well-versed in how to document any type of adverse reaction. So if your patient leaves the office and they have some, uh, some experience that concerns them, make sure they call you back and that you have the ability then to enter that into the vaccine uh, emergency, uh, vaccine adverse events response system or VAERS. Again, it's nice to have an environment that uh, patients feel comfortable. So if they have to lie down, they, they have a place to lie down and that uh, there's someone that can uh, do some adequate assessment uh, of them. Once you have completed vaccination, make sure that everything is documented in the medical record. Everything that happened uh, during that event, um, if, if you, your patient fainted, don't be afraid to document it. Make sure that, that you are, um, are uh, writing down everything that you may have to refer back to uh, in the future when they come back for a next uh, vaccine dose. Uh, talk, uh, document your VIS as well as the addition date, and then any type of follow-up, whether it's uh, more, uh, more vaccines, any additional medication, all in this period of time while you're waiting that 15 minutes, that's everything then to include in that visit. And then talk with your patient about the plan for a follow-up visit. I recommend if they need to come back for another vaccine, make sure they have an appointment when they leave. They can always change that appointment, but that helps then increase the likelihood that they'll come back. Um, everybody now is used to getting a vaccine card or a vaccine record. Um, many, there are many options now, and I think our, our partners from the state will be talking about the port, patient portal that we now have for the state registry that is a wonderful addition. But there are a number of different records that you can help 
and provide for your patient. This just happens to be one that's available through um, immunize.org. But our COVID cards, I think a number of the vaccine companies now are providing uh, vaccine cards that we can use. But I think it's always good for your patient to leave with something uh, so that they can put it in their wallet and use it for reference. After you're done, make sure you're throwing everything in the right container. Remember, you know, we have federal regulation as well as state regulation about what goes in the garbage and what goes into some type of regulated waste. Sharps must immediately go into a sharps container. You don't have to put, I typically put a glass vial in the sharps container just because I don't want somebody to break it and cut themselves. Uh, it does not, it's not required that it go in a sharps container, but to me that's more respectful for the people that are emptying the trash. Um, uh, if you have something that has is soaked or saturated with blood or body fluids, it has to go into red bag or regulated waste. Uh, gloves, band-aids, a dot of blood, all that goes in regular trash. It is not considered to be regulated waste. And then make sure you've got clinic policies regarding how you do all of these things we've talked about. Everything from handling and management of vaccines to safe uh, injection practice to ensuring training and competence of all personnel. And then make sure that you've got a way to, to have that continuous training approach that everyone has mentioned. And then let people know the only way we improve is by getting feedback. I will never know if there's something I'm not doing well unless someone tells me, then I have the opportunity to improve. So that just underscores both mentoring and ongoing education. Now, I know we have um, the handouts that are provided and I included some, these are some posters that we have put together that go through the steps of um, putting together all of your equipment and administering uh, injections, intramuscular, uh, as well as uh, the subcutaneous. These may be helpful uh, for you to use as your training, your personnel, because remember, a vaccine administration is a skill. And so people don't just know this automatically. You need to um, have something that enables you to have a standardized process for training. So every patient, again, has equal opportunity to best practice and safe care.